Hello there. In this sketch, we're going to cover one of the most important conditions you'll need to know for your rotations, sepsis. To set an appropriate mood for a systemic response to infection gone awry, let's dive down into the dirty city sewer system. And who better to teach us about an abnormal response to pathogenic invaders than our favorite adolescent mutated amphibious reptiles? I hope you're ready for this epic battle between good and evil. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of the evaluation and management of sepsis, let's first review a few important definitions and the relevant pathophys. So what is sepsis? The answer is a bit more complicated than you might expect. The definition of sepsis has continued to evolve as we develop a better understanding of it. In 2016, the Society of Critical Care Medicine and European Society of Intensive Care Medicine Task Force put forth an updated set of guidelines known as sepsis-3. The current definition of sepsis is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Great, thanks guys, but what does that mean? There's still a lot we don't know about sepsis, but let's take a little trip down the septic sewer hole and take a look at what we do know. Fear not, young Padawan, soon you too will be masters of the art of sepsis. And hopefully without the smell that comes with it. Ugh. Oh wells, here we go. Normally, when the immune system detects an invasive bacterial, or rarely fungal, infection, depicted by these bacterial lanterns and rogue mushrooms, it activates circulating and fixed phagocytic cells, macrophages in particular, that bind to microbial components and gobble them up. This triggers the release of both pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines and cellular mediators, which provide some balance to the inflammatory response. In sepsis, however, the normally local inflammatory response to infection breaks down, leading to the release of pro-inflammatory mediators into the bloodstream and causing a systemic inflammatory response that affects normal tissues far away from the site of infection. This overwhelming inflammatory response is represented by the unrestrained bacterial lantern starting a fire on that sofa. If that thing's not controlled soon, it could take over the whole underground layer. Multiple factors in this complex runaway inflammatory cascade lead to cellular injury, direct tissue damage, and end organ dysfunction, represented by all these organs in that knocked over trash can. One notable feature of sepsis is the effect it can have on the circulatory system where it causes systemic vasodilation. This is represented by this foot soldier's dilated red headband. The resulting systemic hypotension can lead to tissue hypoperfusion, ischemia, and end organ injury. Okay, so we know the broad definition of sepsis. Say it with me now. Life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Now let's see how we can translate that high-level description into specific clinical criteria that you can look for on the wards. First, start off with a patient in whom you suspect infection, obviously. Next, determine if the patient has organ dysfunction. To do this in a standardized way, we use the sequential organ failure assessment, aka SOFA score. The SOFA system, represented by this, well, SOFA, takes into account a patient's PF ratio, platelet count, bilirubin, mean arterial pressure, Glasgow coma scale, creatinine, and urine output. Each of these seven markers can have a score from zero to four, and the total is added up to give you the patient's overall SOFA score. An increase in the SOFA score by two or more points from baseline, represented by the two fingers in this totally radical 80 skateboard, indicates organ dysfunction. The SOFA score is a well-known system for assessing organ dysfunction and outcomes in critical care, and is also useful for predicting severity and outcomes in sepsis. For example, a SOFA score of two or higher indicates a 10% overall mortality risk for inpatients with suspected infection. The SOFA score is a great tool, but it requires lab testing and is kind of clunky when you're in the moment and trying to assess a patient quickly. That's why doctors developed the Quick SOFA, aka QSOFA score, which quickly identifies patients at higher risk of mortality due to sepsis. This passed out foot soldier is sporting the three components of the QSOFA, which include altered mental status, represented by the brain helmet falling off his head, a respiratory rate greater than 22 breaths per minute, denoted by the design on his snazzy chest cover, and systolic blood pressure less than 100 millimeters of mercury, illustrated by the blood pressure cuff on his arm and the $100 bill skateboard that he slipped on. Patients with two or more of these three Q-SOFA components have a significantly higher mortality risk. To reiterate, the Q-SOFA is not used to diagnose sepsis or organ dysfunction, but it is useful in patients already suspected of sepsis to quickly identify those at greater risk of mortality. You might hear sepsis and septic shock bandied about interchangeably on the wards, but hey, you've got sketchy, 
You know better than that. Septic shock, represented by our recurring symbol, the septic goblin riding on his lightning bolt septic sewer lid, is a subset of sepsis in which circulatory collapse results in a much higher risk of mortality. Clinically, septic shock is defined by a patient who meets the criteria for sepsis and also has a serum lactate level greater than 2 millimoles per liter, represented by the two milk stink bombs the septic goblin is throwing. Additionally, patients with septic shock require vasopressor therapy to keep their mean arterial pressures above 65 millimeters of mercury despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Hence the Model 65 presser rocket powering his lightning-fast septic sewer lid. Everything we've discussed about sepsis so far is based on the 2016 guidelines. However, not everyone's left the old criteria and definitions behind. So you still need to be aware of older terminology like SIRS, sepsis, and severe sepsis. SIRS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, and the four clinical criteria that define it are symbolized by our four reptile ninjas. The first criteria is abnormal body temp, defined as a core temperature greater than 38 or less than 36 degrees Celsius, illustrated by this ninja's bow staff with high and low temperature markings. The second is tachycardia, defined as heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute, represented by this 90-shaped chain with our recurring sketchy heart-shaped pocket watch. The third is hyperventilation, defined as either a respiratory rate above 20 or a PaCO2 of less than 32 millimeters of mercury represented by that CO2 smoke bomb the Blue Ninja is holding. And the final criterion is one of three white blood cell abnormalities, a white count greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000, portrayed by the White Ninja's swords, or more than 10% band neutrophils on the differential, represented by the white sweatbands on his wrists. For many years, sepsis had been defined as having at least two of the four SERS criteria in addition to a confirmed or suspected source of infection. Once again, the two fingers held up on this ninja's skateboard represent the two or more SERS criteria, while the bacterial lanterns above him represent a source of infection. By this older definition, organ dysfunction in the setting of sepsis is defined as severe sepsis. Note that the current guidelines don't make this distinction because organ dysfunction is now included as a part of the definition of straight-up sepsis. Under the old definitions, septic shock is defined as sepsis plus hypotension and hypoperfusion despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So at least that's basically unchanged. Small victories. With all that out of the way, let's see what sepsis looks like in an actual patient. The most important goal of your H&P for a patient with suspected sepsis is to look for the signs and symptoms that suggest infection and identify where it's coming from. The symptoms that suggest infection, fever and chills, are probably pretty obvious to you by now. Fever is represented by our recurring sketchy symbol, the flame bandana, worn by this plucky, strong-willed journalist as she crawls away from septic goblin. Other nonspecific constitutional symptoms associated with systemic infection include weakness, fatigue, and malaise. Once your antennae are raised for an infection, ask about symptoms that'll lead you to its source, represented by this green bacterium bomb about to hit our civilian hostage. There's obviously way too many to go through here, but we're talking about symptoms like a productive cough and pneumonia or dysuria and pyelonephritis. If nothing is readily apparent, go through a comprehensive review of systems to make sure no body part is overlooked. A thorough history is super important since figuring out the source of infection will help you pick the appropriate treatment, including your choice of antibiotics. Other important pieces of history to ask about include risk factors for infection, such as advanced age, immunosuppression, recent surgery, nursing home residence, and recent hospitalization. Fierce and wise old master split, uh, wood chips here, in his hospital gown and sporting a crutch and scalpel weapon, demonstrate some of these risk factors. All right, let's take this opportunity to review the important objective findings you'll see in sepsis. You likely already know this, but while fever isn't exclusive to infection, it should be a pretty solid clue. That said, some populations, like the elderly or immunosuppressed, may be normothermic or even hypothermic in response to severe infection. Fun fact, hypothermia is less common in sepsis, but when it does occur, it's a better predictor of mortality than fever, as systemic inflammation from sepsis causes vasodilation and reduced systemic vascular resistance, heart rate will increase in an attempt to maintain a normal blood pressure. In fact, this compensatory mechanism is the reason tachycardia develops first before hypotension. So always ask yourself why your patient's heart is beating so fast. Typically, a heart rate of 90 or higher is considered tachycardic, 
Sepsis can cause tachypnea due to the combination of direct cytopathic lung injury, systemic inflammatory effects on the medullary respiratory center, and compensation for metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis. Typically, in adults, we define tachypnea as greater than 20 breaths per minute. As we alluded to earlier, blood pressure is usually the last vital sign to become abnormal, so don't rely on it to tell which patients might be in trouble, because they already are. The body tries to maintain organ perfusion pressure as long as possible through a number of compensatory mechanisms. But once those are exhausted, blood pressure will start to fall, and so will the patient. There's no one standard definition for hypotension, but a systolic BP less than 100 is one of the QSOFA criteria, so that's a good place to start. Another commonly used definition of hypotension is a mean arterial pressure less than 65 after adequate fluid resuscitation, which is part of the diagnostic criteria for septic shock. Before we move on to the physical exam, it's important to note that most of the abnormal exam findings you might see in sepsis depend on the specific source of infection. That's why a comprehensive head-to-toe exam, looking for the source of infection, is a crucial part of the evaluation of a patient with sepsis. Just like these comprehensive security camera stations, make sure to look everywhere, including a thorough skin exam. You don't want to be the guy who missed the infected diabetic foot ulcer just because you didn't take off the patient's socks. In any case, there are a few general physical exam findings that can be seen regardless of the specific source of infection. Early septic shock is a type of distributive shock. And, as you might remember from our shock force sketches, distributive shock is characterized by vasodilation. On exam, that means your patient will initially have warm extremities, represented by this warm faucet handle by the sink. In late septic shock, peripheral vasoconstriction eventually takes over in order to shunt blood to the vital organs, leading to cold extremities, just like the cold faucet handle over here. We also need to look for signs of end organ dysfunction. In the brain, this can manifest as confusion or encephalopathy, especially in the elderly. This is why altered mental status is included in the SOFA and QSOFA scoring systems. The kidneys, too, are quite sensitive to an acute drop in perfusion pressure. Decreased urine output is the most common manifestation of acute kidney injury due to poor renal perfusion. Like many other diseases that affect the entire body, lab testing can be very helpful in the diagnosis of sepsis, quantifying the extent of end organ injury and predicting outcomes. White blood cell count is an important marker of inflammation and should alert you to possible infection. As you might remember, leukocytosis, with the white count greater than 12,000, or leukopenia, with the white count less than 4,000, is one of our SIRS criteria. You'll hear the term left shift frequently on the wards, and you might wonder what that means. Simply put, it's when more immature neutrophil forms, such as bands, represented by these white sweatbands on our white ninja's wrists, are present on the differential count. A left shift indicates that the immune system is in reactive overdrive, pumping out whatever cells it can to go fight off infection. Remember, leukocytosis is most commonly associated with infection, but it's not necessarily required. You might not see elevated white cells in early infection or in immunosuppressed patients. And don't forget about leukopenia, which can also be a manifestation of sepsis, especially in the elderly. Don't just look at the white count on your CBC and move on. Take note of the platelet count too, since it's a component of the SOFA score. Platelet count is an acute phase reactant, rising in response to systemic inflammation. Advanced sepsis, however, can cause the platelet count to decline. So if you see thrombocytopenia, represented by the dirty plates that have been left low on the ground on the CBC, beware. Elevated BUN, creatinine, and bilirubin suggest renal and hepatic dysfunction, respectively, and are components of the SOFA score. This meal fit for a hormonal teen illustrates these points, complete with our recurring sketchy BUN bun bag and leftover liver-shaped pizza slice, all bought with that creatinine credit card. Lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism, which means if your body's not delivering enough oxygen to tissues, you'll see more of it. Lactate has long served as a marker of sepsis. Remember that part of the definition of septic shock involves an elevated serum lactate level despite adequate volume resuscitation. As lactate builds up in tissues, it also worsens metabolic acidosis, compounding problems with cellular metabolism. The converse is true as well. One way we evaluate a septic patient's response to treatment is to monitor their lactate, which serves as a surrogate marker of tissue perfusion. That's it for the lab tests we use to help us diagnose and risk stratify patients with sepsis. Before we move on, though, 
Let's talk about a few of the tests you'll get in every patient with suspected sepsis to identify the source of infection. Blood culture should be collected as soon as possible on every patient with suspected sepsis. Ideally, you'll get them before you start antibiotics, but don't delay treatment just to get labs if your patient's life is at stake. Next, collect urine for urinalysis and culture. Naturally, you're looking for a UTI, one of the most common sources of infection leading to sepsis, especially in older patients. Besides blood and urine, other body fluids should be collected for culture only if your history and physical raises suspicion for a particular source of infection, such as synovial fluid in suspected joint infection or CSF in suspected meningitis. Let's keep this source ID party going by moving on to imaging. We'll kick things off with the old standby, chest x-ray. A chest x-ray, represented by our recurring sketchy skull and X-bones flag, should be ordered on all patients with suspected sepsis. It's a cheap, fast, and effective way to look for pneumonia, one of the most common sources of bacterial infection leading to sepsis. Just like for the other tests, additional workup or imaging might be needed based on the clues you find from your history and comprehensive physical exam. For example, if your septic patient has left lower quadrant tenderness and a history of diverticulitis, maybe you'll want to order a CT abdomen and pelvis to look for an intra-abdominal abscess. Let's summarize the presentation for a patient with suspected sepsis in a sample assessment statement. K. Rang is a 72-year-old man with hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and dementia brought to the ED from a long-term care facility with fever, chills, and altered mental status for two days. Facility staff provided the history. They state that he's been more confused than his baseline over the past 24 hours. Vitals are significant for a rectal temp of 39.4, heart rate of 110, respiratory rate of 24, BP of 105 over 60, and O2 sat of 96% on room air. His exam is notable for dry mucous membranes, a GCS of 13, and suprapubic tenderness. His CBC is significant for a white count of 20,000 with 88% neutrophils and 5% bands on the differential and a platelet count of 140,000. Additional labs are significant for a serum BUN of 40, creatinine of 1.6, and lactate of 2.5. Urinalysis is significant for nitrates, large leukocyte esterase, many white cells, and many bacteria. Blood and urine cultures are pending. Given his Q-SOFA score of 2, positive SIRS criteria, and laboratory evidence of UTI, the most likely diagnosis for Mr. Rang is sepsis. Good on you for catching sepsis. Unfortunately, despite all the advancements we've made in its management, sepsis still carries a high mortality rate. Given the potential for a terrible outcome, that is, death, all patients with sepsis should be admitted to the hospital, and sicker patients, such as those with septic shock or a Q-SOFA score of 2 or higher, should be admitted to the ICU. This should come as no surprise, but just like all sick patients, the first step in sepsis management are the ABCs. Represented by our recurring sketchy symbol, the ABC electric van. Begin with airway and breathing, and if intubation and mechanical ventilation isn't necessary, move on to circulation. As you might remember from our shock force sketch, one cornerstone of initial management in septic shock, and sepsis in general, is aggressive IV fluid resuscitation to raise blood pressure and restore organ perfusion, hence this water filling station filling up the ABC electric truck. Environmentally friendly. Nice. The sepsis 3 guidelines don't exactly say what quote unquote adequate fluid resuscitation is. But in general, patients should be bolused at least 30 milliliters per kilogram of IV crystalloids to start. These recommendations are backed up by the surviving sepsis campaign. Speaking of IVs, you'll need access to deliver those fluids. So make sure that you have at least two large bore peripheral IVs or a central line. This might go without saying, but for every intervention you give, you gotta monitor the patient's response. In the case of fluid resuscitation, the next step after giving a bolus is figuring out if more fluids or vasopressors are needed. If IV fluids alone aren't able to raise the blood pressure high enough to support adequate end organ perfusion, the next step is to add vasopressors. Which is why we've drawn in this compressor machine here to pump those saggy tires. The goal BP you're aiming for is a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury or higher to allow for adequate end organ perfusion. We won't get into the details of specific presser drugs here, but in general, norepinephrine is the most commonly recommended first-line presser for septic shock. Check out our sketches dedicated to shock for more details on the specific pressers to use in each type. The other cornerstone of initial sepsis management, in addition to IV fluids, is antibiotic therapy. 
So while you're bolusing your patient with IV fluids, start empiric broad-spectrum antibiotics to treat their infection. The word early is super important here, since plenty of evidence shows that every hour of delay in starting antibiotics increases the mortality of patients with sepsis. Since you won't have much information on the specific bug causing all this havoc, the key for initial management is using broad-spectrum antibiotics, represented by the broad-spectrum rainbow above this antibiotic pill bottle. Use what knowledge you do have about suspected sites of infection and their most common culprits to guide your selection of empiric antibiotic therapy. Last but not least, don't forget about the importance of source control. What do I mean? Well, sometimes antibiotics alone aren't sufficient to cure an infection. We're talking cases like abscesses that require incision and drainage, infected foreign bodies or catheters that need to be removed, or infected necrotic tissue that requires surgical debridement. So don't forget to ask your friendly neighborhood surgeon for a little help with their scalpel if you need it. Trust me, they love to cut things. Okay, let's wrap up this sketch with a brief review of what we've learned. Sepsis is defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. The 2016 clinical criteria for sepsis included a suspected infection and organ dysfunction, defined as a SOFA score increase from baseline by two points, or a score of two or higher if the baseline is unknown. The Q-SOFA score is a quick tool to predict the risk of mortality and severity of illness. It assesses only three criteria, altered mental status, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. Septic shock is a subset of sepsis with circulatory, cellular, and metabolic dysfunction that's associated with higher mortality. In addition to meeting criteria for sepsis, patients with septic shock have a serum lactate level greater than 2 and a mean arterial pressure less than 65 after adequate IV fluid resuscitation. Sepsis was formerly defined as suspected infection plus at least two of the four SERS criteria, which include a core temp of greater than 38 or less than 36 degrees Celsius, heart rate greater than 90, respiratory rate greater than 20, or PaCO2 less than 32, and a white count greater than 12, less than 4, or greater than 10% band forms on the diff. The presenting symptoms of sepsis are nonspecific, including fever, chills, and malaise, in addition to other symptoms that are specific to the underlying infectious source. The objective information in sepsis is quite important. Naturally, vital signs are vital, as are physical exam findings that suggest poor perfusion or organ dysfunction, like altered mental status and low urine output. The tests you'll be ordering in all patients with suspected sepsis include a white cell count and differential, platelets, BUN, creatinine, bilirubin, lactate, urinalysis, and chest x-ray. Last but certainly not least, make sure to get blood and urine cultures as soon as possible, ideally before you start antibiotics. When it comes to the initial management of septic patients, the first step is IV fluid resuscitation, followed by vasopressor administration if fluids aren't enough to maintain adequate end organ perfusion. Additionally, empiric broad-spectrum antibiotics should be started as soon as possible. And lastly, don't forget that some infections may need additional intervention for source control. Hopefully now you're feeling confident in your ability to vanquish your sepsis foes. Like ninjas. Ninjas. Ninjas.